to the microphone. Who would like to get us started? In fact, if you want to line up, we can take a few at a time if there are a lot of questions, and I'd welcome that. Introduce yourself. Um, keep your question as, as brief as you can, and we'll get in as much as we can. Go ahead. Hi. Uh, my name is Kareem Kabra. Um, thank you for this uh, discussion. This is excellent. Um, I was kind of just wondering uh, for Nira, um, we've had some candidates in the uh, presidential um, debates talking about um, possibly tying in the uh, climate change issue as a health care issue. Yeah. Um, primarily, I know uh, Marianne Williamson brought mm -hmm. that up a lot, and there were other candidates who, mm -hmm. who took that on. Um, do you think that's um, a positive uh, for a Democratic candidate to actually uh, use that and tie it together? Um, I know that you had you were saying that using it as an economic positive, but whether you should also um, tie it into the health yeah. debate. Yeah, that's a great that's a great question. Uh, I I I I agree. I would agree that. Uh, uh, talking about the health impacts is a really important issue and that I, I don't mean to say that making the economic case is the only case to make. I, I also think particularly for different constituencies, um, women in particular, um, families, talking, ab talking about how a climate plan can address issues that they're facing, health care, ra uh, asthma rates, cancer rates in some communities, is really important. Now, you have to deal in some of these issues, you have to deal with not just climate impact, um, but also just pollution impact. So it's not just carbon dioxide emissions, it's other things like sulfur dioxide and other issues. But I think that is an important, as uh, an important asset and really is a way to talk about it in different, in different settings. One of the reasons why climate has moved as an issue is that um, people in suburbs see it as an increasing issue and they see it both from a um, climate perspective, but also from a health perspective. Other question? Hi, I'm Denise Schlenner, and uh, I want to talk about putting a price on carbon. Mm -hmm. uh, when I last looked, several of the leading candidates were not in favor of a, of a price on carbon. I'm curious about uh, your views on why they are resistant and how we can change that. I think I think m most of the candidates have s come out to say that they uh, they they support a structure, but they have not endorsed a carbon tax, which is a way to a bit like create some blur lines <laughs> here and to be perhaps maybe not own the carbon tax in the general election. But a lot of them have talked about some legal system or a limit li ability to actually. Um, affect the carbon price, which is, you know, I'm to be blunt, uh, probably, um, you know, kind of an exit out of uh, being uh, attacked on this during the presidential debate. I think we have to. I think we have to give them lessons or, or or strategies. I do think a lot of candidates are anxious about what Frank said, which is. I actually remember the BTU tax <laughs> debate in 1993. That was Al Gore's. Uh, Al Gore wanted uh, that in the 1993 budget deal, and it became a source of big consternation. And so I think the, the challenge we have, and it is an honest challenge, is that families feel very stressed from everyday life. Working class families haven't seen an income rise in really 40 years, except for uh, a, a couple of years in the 90s. And that is going to be a fear everyone plays on. So that is why we structured a carbon tax, so that we inoculate those families. But I'm not impervious to the fact that people will still get attacked on this issue. But we have to, we have to give candidates the opportunity to talk about how they're going to both inoculate those concerns and also what the benefit over the long term is. So you are raising resources to create climate jobs in different spaces. But I, I, th I think we should, we should be clear that around the world, um, conservatives have attacked candidates on the climate issue. In Australia, they just had an election where people thought the Labor Party was going to win. It, it lost to the conservatives. And conservatives attacked on climate and climate costs and taxes. Um, pretty vociferously. Now, labor didn't prepare itself particularly well on this trade-off issue, and I think we have to be clear but about but that. But I think we could also be a little bit more sensitive 
as constituents about arguments you need to use in an election and arguments you need to use in, in once people are in office. Uh, and I am all for creating all kinds of accountability for when people are in office, but perhaps giving them some more leeway when they're running. But it's really, really interesting to think, and if the next person who's got a question, please make your way to the mic, but it's really th th interesting to think about how, how fraught our history is with taxation in this country. And it's more than just that families are taxed, if you will, but, but there's, a, there's a basic distrust of government and how you're going to spend this money, right? So I remember yeah. way back when, way back when, there was a suggestion to put the federal gas tax up by 25%, 25 cents, putting it up 10 cents, 10 cents, 5 cents over several years. It went down. It didn't succeed. You would have thought that you were tripling people's taxes. Um, you remember uh, George Herbert Walker Bush. Arguably, he didn't get reelected because when he first ran, he said, read my lips, no new taxes, and then he raised taxes to balance the budget for all the right reasons. But he was ultimately punished for that. Um, and, and so uh, in, in, locally in Virginia several years ago, there was a proposal to raise the sales tax by a half a percent mm -hmm. and put all the revenues into fixing traffic congestion. And anybody who's driven in northern Virginia knows how horrible the traffic. That was a very tangible thing. And that was defeated because people drove, the opponents to it said, you can't trust government to spend your money the right way to do the right thing. So getting a carbon tax which Denise and others you mm -hmm. know, properly raised would, and, and would be a, 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 a determinative issue on the issue of, of climate change. It really would drive behavior as, 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 as cost does. Is, is more than just convincing people you know, that it's not going to hurt their pocketbook. There's a trust issue. There are deeper things at, at play. Yeah, I think also one thing we should, we should recognize is that um, one of the arguments of the Green New Deal is to is to think through subsidy versus tax, right? right? So call it something different. Well, it, it it is. I mean, it it is structured differently. It's essentially the federal government is spending money to incentivize positive behavior and versus taxing bad behavior. Um, and you know, I mean, it isn't an innovation. And and you and critic our people from the left will argue that a carbon tax is unfair because it is disproportionately hurting low-income people. Right. And, um, and you know, we have a solution to that, which is to uh, inoculate uh, for low-income people. But we should take those criticisms seriously. When in France they did a, a gas tax uh, from a carbon perspective, you know, the left and the right hit Macron for doing that, and there were big protests. So my, my view is, uh, and we talk about this in our report, I do think that there are lots of areas to subsidize positive behavior, renewables and other areas. We shouldn't take away from a carbon tax. But I, I think one of the, the positives of a subsidy perspective is less per punitive. And, you know, truthfully, we, our tax code, you know, if we reoriented our tax code to just what it was in how it taxed wealthy people in 1995, we would have trillions of dollars of more money to use on challenges the country faces. My name is Mary Sirdana. Um, my question has to do with the distinction between adaptation and mitigation mm -hmm. um, in terms of messaging and how that might play into bridging the partisan divide. Adaptation being responding to effects that we face currently mm -hmm. and mitigation as you know, emitting and using less carbon-based activities. And yeah. so do you think that there is a need to focus more on adaptation rather than mitigation? And do you think that there's a distinction in terms of messaging that one needs to be focused more upon? Yeah, I, I mean, I think that's a, it's an important argument. And you saw, I mean, Andrew Yang in the debate yesterday talked, has, has talked about it, adaptation a, a great deal. Um, I think the problem with adaptation is that we, um, you know, we really can't live with just a pure <laughs> adaptation strategy because the effects of climate are so intense over the long term. I mean, you know, doing nothing, we get to a 4% four, four degree um, increase by the end of the century, which would be, you know, kind of not to be too naysaying, but really kind of cataclysmic <laughs> result <laughs> for our the planet. So I, I'm all for talking about both of those issues, but at the end of the day, we do need to create a political resolve in this country to take action to mitigate 
um, and to change our behavior so that we are uh, just moving off a carbon intense economy. That's just, you know, we just have to do that. And the world has to do it. You have to Not do both. Just us. You have to do both. Yeah, we have to, I mean, we have to do both. But, um, you know, w the truth is the less we do the former, the less we are mitigating, just the more you have to do on adaptation. And the truth is, you know, you can't, you can't do adaptation in a way, just to be frank about it, that is environment, is, is, um, is just. But you also can't adapt your way and bring back a million extinct species. <laughs> no, you can't. You can't I mean, I mean, you know, you basically, I mean, you're basically like we, I mean, we don't even, I mean, the real problem is we don't even actually really understand what would happen to the world and sea levels and all these things. I mean, the risks are really profound. And so um, I, I think uh, I, I would not make a deal on mitigation with conservatives or something <laughs> because in order to, that's just shirking our responsibility to solve this problem. And, um, and you know, I mean, to be optimistic, we, there are things we can do that are not that painful. I mean, think about Arizona. Like I went to, I traveled to, I was in Arizona recently, and Arizona is a place which could really move to 100% renewable energy or near 100% renewable energy very quickly just from the nature of the state. Um, which really, it just uh, states that have that ability could, Florida could move to almost 100% renewable. We have the technology, it's cheaper, it's really a question of political will. And it's dealing with existing incumbents, honestly. Right. Right. And so, you know, this is the, this is the, the opportunity of the Green New Deal or the language around the Green New Deal that I think is positive is it captures the idea that we have a challenge for the country that if we solve correctly can make us all better off. That was really the moonshot idea. And I think that is the way to approach this issue, which is we don't, you know, there are costs, but there are so many benefits if we handle it properly. Other question. Hi, um, I'm Francesca. I'm a sophomore at GW and I write articles for sustainability department here and for Plant Forward. Um, my question has to do with the point that Frank brought up about youth climate activism. Mm -hmm. So I participated in the youth climate strike in DC in September and I've been striking on Fridays with the Fridays for Future movement, which are just a bunch of like high school and college students who strike on right. Capitol Hill every Friday. And a lot of um, the youth's concerns, especially those under 18, are that climate change will be an issue when they become adults, like one of the, their biggest issues, but they're currently too young to vote. And so um, their concerns have to do with the fact that because they're unable to vote, they're unable to really influence policy as much. And so my question is, how do you think that these climate uh, um, climate strikes and these efforts are able to influence policy and um, the future election if they cannot vote? Do you think that adults will kind of hear their voice and vote on behalf of them knowing that the youth don't have the ability to vote in this election? Great yeah, question. that's a great question. You know, actually, I mean, just to say, um, Voting is a, is obviously a very important aspect of working a, of our democracy, but it's not the only aspect you can have your voice heard, which is there's multiple ways. There's protesting, which is what um, you're talking about, but there's also volunteering on campaigns. There's uh, working with the political leaders directly by volunteering in campaigns or in government or in other structures. Um, I, 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 I personally think one of our great challenges in the climate debate is how polarized and asymmetric it is. Um, so you have Democrats who believe in it and want to take some action, and maybe they're slow or recalcitrant, but they actually believe in it. And then we have another, Repub another party, which again, as I said, is unique in the world for not wanting to solve this problem at all. So I think one of the, one of the frustrations that you hear from political leaders is that uh, the strikes should take place everywhere, right? So it's really like a, there was a, there's been this whole debate with the Sunrise Movement, which has been a fantastic movement at capturing public attention and making, I think, changing the discourse and making many more Democrats focus on climate, which is really important. But we also have to create political impact in Republican, on Republicans, in Republican districts. And what we learned, you know, we did a lot of work on the Affordable Care Act and protecting the Affordable Care Act. 
the way we did that is is not just marshaling the voices of Democrats or pushing them, but also marshal it, creating real pressure on Republicans in Republican districts and Republican town halls. So my 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 voice for my my believe activism has a big role and changes the nature and is one of the reasons why we have more discussion of climate in the Democratic primary, which is all to the good. But we to actually have climate action need to ensure that both parties are acting and Republican political leaders have to feel some pressure around this issue because all their pressure is donor based from cons from donor constituents who are incumbent energy actors. And there needs to be a cross pressure on this issue if you want to see any movement. Thanks. Next. To GW, uh, my name is Shana Green and I'm a senior at SMPA, so really appreciate you being here. Um, my question is about uh, the issue of national security. Mm -hmm. In September, Mayor Pete Buttigieg wrote an essay for CNN calling climate change the security challenge of our time. Do you believe that the national security frame would help convince uh, climate skeptics across the aisle? Thank you. Well, uh, interestingly, you know, the CIA does an analysis of threats, national security threats to the country. Um, and it's been doing this analysis, uh, you know, basically annually. And for years, it has found climate change to be a national security, a national security threat for the United States. So I think this is an important frame um, and a, a good frame. Um, and I think important for, for different constituencies. But I, I essentially think that um, one of the challenges is not that we, I think we are getting people to understand that climate is a problem. <laughs> I think more and more people get that. It's we have to build support for the solutions and what the stakes are around the solutions. So I think that's a, it's a fine frame to use, but we also have to think about how we get people to take action and I would, I would, I would just say that people are the the public is much more anxious about trade offs and and why it's important to also communicate on the economic side. I, well, let me ask you uh, something that's associated with that, and then we've got a couple last questions, and then we'll go down to a reception. Um, when you think about leadership in in the climate space, um, we hear a lot from, and our students talk a lot too, and we have some representatives in the audience today from corporate America. Mm -hmm. I don't hear Democrats talk about that very much. I hear you. I hear Democrats attacking corporate America, especially fossil fuel interests. But I've even I've 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 met and, and talked with uh, executives from the fossil fuel industry who r claim anyway to recognize that climate change is an issue. Uh, I talk to uh, certainly people in other industries, um, in agriculture, who talk exactly about what you talked about: precision agriculture, um, bringing inputs down, using less water, being more sustainable mm -hmm. because. The business model requires it, the planet demands it, all that kind of thing. Um, what about teaming up in a more concerted way with corporate leaders to drive uh, a climate message that cuts across sectors and connects directly with um, economic interests? I think that's a, a great idea. I, I would just be a little jaded on this topic only because um, uh, when uh, Donald Trump decided to exit the Paris Accords. Um, you know, there was a concerted effort, I was part of it, to attract more business leaders to, to lead the criticism, to argue, to, to talk to the president. To, and there were business leaders. I, I don't think there were, there were business leaders who, you know, talked, lobbed calls into the White House. Well, several on the We're Still In movement included a lot of, a lot of business Yes, a but lot. And, and there, but I, my experience, is that when it really comes push, push comes to shove, um, I saw a lot more fervent activity by the business community on the Trump tax cut than I have seen them on any other issue. And so I think when we have a, I'm hopeful we will have a, a Democratic administration. And I do believe that corporate America has shifted over the last several years and, and can be a important asset in the debate, particularly on the economy, and I have made this argument to many business leaders. Um, I mean, a couple of weeks ago, Bill Gates was in town and talking to a lot of you people. You and he were hanging out. <laughs> I was in a meeting with him. Did you twist his arm? And I, I made the case. And you know, I made mean, a few he, billion dollars. He has, he, has a, he has a deep and concerted interest 
And I made this argument to him, which is that, you know, that, that given the salience of the economic arguments on both sides, it's really important for business leaders to step up and say that climate can be a win-win for the country. An economic win. You mean, you mean for them to have a public profile on this? To have a public profile, to argue publicly. I mean, Bill Gates is already doing this, so. Well, I, yeah, and Microsoft actually has a carbon tax that they build into their internal budgeting. Yes. Well, they're way out in front with it. Yeah, so they're way advanced. Um, uh, and lots of, and uh, it's, to be fair, f and a fair number of tech companies are. But to try and galvanize other leaders, I do think that's an important issue. I just am uh, slightly jaded in that the true clout of the business community has in the past been around issues that affect their economic bottom line more closely. But in the future, you know, you take you take allies wherever you can, and particularly on, a, on an existential threat. So in the future, I hope that they will be a key asset. Let me do this. I see three people with questions. Why don't I invite all three of you up, quickly c go through your questions, we'll write them down, and we'll let Nira answer all of them, and we'll get everybody off to reception. Go, go ahead. Um, hi, my name is Amy Patronella. I am a junior studying political communication here, uh, and I also intern with the Center for American Progress. Oh, how was it? Energy. <laughs> it's great. <laughs> okay, great. Um, great. Yes, I'll if be on If it was today. bad, that would have been really, <laughs> really awkward. No. Um, so I'm wondering, um, Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren have been speaking about climate change uh, as an issue of corruption and talking about potentially pursuing charges for fossil fuel companies who have been disseminating mm -hmm. uh, widespread disinformation campaigns for 40 years um, about what carbon's doing to our world. Um, so how do we balance pursuing criminal charges while also trying to paint climate change as an opportunity to better our future? Um, and the more positive lights, such as uh, um, in the Green New Deal. Criminal charges versus opportunity for the future. Yes. Okay, next question. Thank you. Hi, my name is Mark Hankin, and I was a student here about 45 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> it's a so you started statement that you're back. <laughs> yeah, it is, isn't it? Um, uh, you started off talking about jobs, um, and I want this question's about jobs and trade, and how the Republicans and Trump have helped uh, inflame the discussion about climate and climate action by us in the United States being uh, unfair in, in terms of China, India, other countries not doing anything about it. And in fact, he links job loss here in climate to job loss with trade. How, do you, how should Democratic candidates uh, respond to that? That's a right. good question. And finally. Hi, uh, my name is Brandon Mallbranch. Um, my question is about uh, framing and polarization. Uh, you guys were talking about that a little bit during the discussion. Um, throughout the past couple years, uh, we've seen a lot of people champion uh, climate change things, uh, so like Greta Thornburg, mm -hmm. or uh, you, we mentioned David Hogg's, not for climate change, but in a similar light, uh, championing uh, progressive issues. Um, but when we talk about framing uh, on the other side, uh, that's often framed in a negative, more idealistic light. So when you're working with your candidates, how do you balance um, framing your issues such as climate change or like uh, a uh, carbon tax without be uh, seeming too idealistic or um, naive about the issues? Mm -hmm. All right, great. Thank you very much. You want to start with uh, the future <laughs> with Amy's question? Uh, which is the, is that the, is... That's, that's about uh, opportunities for the future. And oh, and the, um, I think it's about jailing people versus opportunities. Criminal charges. Criminal, criminal charges. charges. Criminal charges. Um, so, uh, you know, our plan does, hasn't called for criminal charges. I, I mean, I, just to be honest about that, um, I think, I think the truth is that there is, um, there's a segment uh, of the, uh, progressive electorate who, or progressive base that is deeply angry about um, what is happening in our climate and legitimately makes the connection between um, oil industry and what it's done and what it's known. Um, there's been litigation to really determine how long the energy companies have known about the effects of climate and we are learning more and more that they've known for a very long time, which is, you know, deeply angering. Um, and, you know, and I think Warren and others and Sanders have uh, connected it to a distrust of Washington per se. Um, whether, you know, jailing people is like the most optimistic way to put that. And one, one concern I have 
about that is in many states, conservatives have attacked, this definitely has happened in Texas, conservatives have attacked, um, have, have bled the connection between like energy company CEOs and everyone who works in energy, right? So in Texas, when you know, progressives have talked about some of the behavior of energy company CEOs, conservatives have been very effective at making the case that you know, Democrats are basically trying to go after anyone who pumps gas or works on an oil rig. So I think we have to be mindful. I mean, one of the challenges... But is, it, but is it a smart... I mean, the question really gets to it. Should there be criminal charges brought against energy, energy companies? I mean, I, I think... Do you feel that I that's... Is that, a pro, is that a productive way to engage I think the conversation? This, I think this... From my perspective, I think it is a hard... It is a hard issue because I think sometimes these companies have, like, knowingly polluted. <laughs> but I, my, my, my personal view um, is, just speaking for myself that it is probably easier to get a majority of the country behind a climate plan in which you are much more focused on how you're going to, how the climate plan is actually going to improve people's lives than the punishment it's going to mete out. Um, because I also think even if you're just past the CEO perspective, we, we do as progressives and, and Democrats have to, have to think through how, how the other side will use these arguments to attack the whole issue. And we have to be mindful of that. Like I, and I'll give the example. Dem Republicans very much focused on abolishing ICE, right? When any Democrats talked about abolishing ICE, they started running campaigns about abolishing ICE. And what was that abolishing ICE about? It was about open borders. And that is a salient attack. So you can combat that by talking about strong borders or comprehensive immigration reform, but you can't ignore the attack. Because when, you know, Donald Trump has a very big megaphone, the most asymmetric advantage he has in running for re-election is he has a media dominance I have never seen in my life by any political leader in, in modern history. And so you have to be mindful of the attacks he'll make. Um, but, you know, the opportunity around climate is that you have a stronger majority for action than you've ever had before. Next question, Mark's question about jobs, trade, India. Um, and the position with um, uh, job loss and trade that the Republicans Yeah, so I, I mean, the, the thing I think we do have to think very much about is, you know, n the nuanced conservative argument against climate action in the United States is to make the case that India and China's actions and, ch and contributions are beginning to dwarf uh, America's America's climate emission, I mean, it's not totally true, but they make the argument that essentially the real issue is what China and India are doing, so why are we taking action when they need to, you know, when they need to do things now? China is taking action, um, and it is still the case that the United States is a large-scale disproportionate emitter, right? We are um, way out of line per capita producing, uh, you know, the, the net carbon impact is much higher per, pa per mm -hmm. capita in the United mm -hmm. States than in China or India. But we do, and we do have to make the case that we all have to do it. But one of the reasons why I think it's important to have an economic win-win argument is then you're less susceptible to why are we punishing ourselves when other countries aren't doing enough. And if you make a win argument, you know, this is a way by which we are actually not punishing ourselves. We're actually trying to improve our, our country and, and work to the benefit of our economy. And the last question on framing and polarization and how you balance um, the carbon tax and, and, and you know, with the, with, the, with the negative frame that that, if I got that right, with the, right? Yeah, I mean, I think we have to always be mindful of, of polarization and um, it is, it is, it is, this is a, this is a change, this is a time that I've never experienced before in which you can have such, it's a plurality, it's not a majority, but it is a large percentage of people who will believe something because Trump has said it. So I think we do have to be uh, a mindful of that. And that is why, you know, again, that is another reason why I think we have to be aware of the attacks that are coming and, and almost pre-position for them like you would in any other in any, any battle which is to make the arguments most effectively about how people will be better off 
and that this isn't, you know, you're not asking, at the end of the day, if people think that they're sacrificing, uh, that is one frame that their mind will go into. If they're thinking we're all taking action that will improve us for the long term, that's a different frame. And so we should try to go in the latter instead of the former. Well, before we go to our um, reception and uh, enjoy some some drinks and some sustainably <laughs> sustainably um, farmed food. Mm -hmm. uh, so who's going to win? Among Democrats, I mean. Aha. I don't know. <laughs> who, who would you like to win? I won't say. <laughs> who's most electable? Uh, you know, I think electability is a is a, it is in the eye of the beholder. But this conversation, I think, is an important one, which is. Um, I'll give you my guidance on electability. My guidance on electability is we should think through the candidate who can take a punch and punch back. Meaning Donald Trump is going to, Donald Trump's uh, political strategy is not to reach out to the middle in the country. It is not to create a broad majority for him. It is to uh, polarize, like, is to polarize the debate, generate massive enthusiasm about his base, and then nuclear bomb the Democratic nominee. So I think the real question is, and I think of it this way, and you know, I, truthfully, I change my mind sometimes hour by hour, but is to think through who ha who can, who ha who can get uh, a trillion dollars spent on them, or who has had a trillion dollars spent on them and survive. You know, the truth is Bill Clinton, uh, the Republicans do this to every Democratic candidate. They did it to Bill Clinton. They did it to Al Gore. They did it to John Kerry. Uh, they did it to Barack Obama. And they did it to Hillary Clinton. Barack Obama, they did it sort of a little late. But they do it to every candidate. They figure out a way to otherize them or take a, a strength they have and make it a weakness, you know, whether it's emails or Swift Boat. Um, that's what they do. But we do, we do produce candidates in the Democratic Party who are able to withstand that. And Bill Clinton and Barack Obama are two candidates who had personal, you know, had a personal connection to voters that allowed those voters to always believe, even through the entirety of their presidencies, um, when they went through really tough times and uh, went through a lot of attacks, that at the end of the day, those two presidents, uh, you know, were on their side. And so I think that's, you know, that I kind of think could change, you know, you have to be good at taking the attack, but you also have to be able to withstand the attack through a personal. So that's how I kind of measure it. Well, um, <laughs> I think it's pretty clear and that I'm they're going to have to take attack. This is going to, look, this is going to be a super nasty, super polarizing, super high turnout election, period, full stop. Where it goes, who knows? It's going to be decided so in a handful of states. Yeah, and right? I'm going to be, opti I'm going to end in my note of optimism. Oh, good. You know, I look at this like any, you know, America has gone through many inflection points, right, where we kind of go through a very tough time. We look at we're highly polarized. Debates are really intense. And we face these really tough questions. And this this moment, you know, we're having debates about who who's American and what, am, what who is America for and what are the challenges we have. And... What is truth? I mean, we're really debating very basic questions. But the question for us for 2020 is whether we use this as an inflection point, whether we actually create a large majority that repudiates the kind of politics we're seeing. And if we do, the country will move in a different direction. And I, can, I believe it will move in a more progressive direction. And we could actually, with a large majority, could actually take action on climate or and solve a variety of other problems. Things seem impossible a lot in politics, but things can also move very quickly in politics. And so, you know, I think this is a historic opportunity. If we get the same level of turnout, the same share that we did just a few years ago, you could see large-scale political change. How, how many people in the room are active on social media? Okay. How many people in the room, combining all your social media, have more than 1,000 friends, followers, contacts, whatever? More than 1,000. Okay, look at the number of hands. So in this room, yes, in exactly. this room, there is you represent a community much larger than the margins by which Donald Trump won Michigan or Hillary Clinton won New Hampshire. Just think about that. Just yeah. in this room. So that's the also the thing that we're gonna see is the power of people to mobilize 
and how this affects it. So it's going to be, I mean, we I've had, been doing this for a while. Yeah. It's pretty fascinating where we are right now. Yeah, and, and I'd say, the, I mean, we had the largest scale political mobilization the day after Trump was elected. You know, the, I mean, we've never seen protests like that ever in the United States. And, you know, so this is a moment where we face. And he mobilizes what, his. Yes. He mobilizes his team. Would you join me in thanking Neera Tannen? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So good. It was great.